Stallion, we've mentioned this before that a lion is tamed by a man with a whip and a three or four legged stool because they see each one of those things as threats. And the old adage of a confused mind does nothing. And I think that we see that in, in us and in those in our community when they get confused with too many options. Today's podcast, we're going to break down our passive income report. And man, there is a big opportunity for you to have a confused mind because we're sharing with you so many different ideas that we have done and are doing. But the point behind this is for you to be learning. So, Joey, when you think of the things that we're doing, what sort of ideas does it give you? Well, speaking of uh, lion, um, I, I, this is the first thing that comes to my mind. It may have nothing to do with what you actually want me to talk about. But I was at my um, my mom's house recently, and all of our family was together for a funeral. My little niece, she's probably nine, ten years old. She's sitting there. And I had just written on my cup, stallion. You know, of right. course, my little solo cup, everybody does that when there's a bunch of people at the house, you know, you write your name on there with a Sharpie. Of course, mine is Stallion. So I'm holding it up, drinking out of it. And I walk into the room and my little niece, she looks up at me and she says, what's a stale lion? <laughs> and I was like, man, I, I must have looked at her like a confused lion. And uh, as you just got done saying it, but. I was like, man, that's a big ego, ego drop there, you know, stallion to stale lion. Uh, maybe that's what happens when they get old. Uh, maybe, maybe she knew what our passive income report looked like this <laughs> month. And she was like, man, you guys got to freshen that thing up a little bit. No stale doubt. Stale lion. I'm going to have to in, insert that somehow in our next intro for the round table for sure. Well, we won't take any more from this podcast. If you hadn't had a chance to follow us on YouTube, go do that. Cause every, Every time we uh, do this passive income report, we go live, you get notified, you can actually get it ahead of time and see our numbers and understand what we're talking about. As always, we appreciate you. If you need help with something, reach out to our team. You can go to whatswatwallstreet.com forward slash free call. And one of our coaches can walk through with you a process that we call the right next thing that helps you understand what is the next step that you should be working on to help you get closer to your goal of becoming financially free and stop trading time for money. Joey, let's jump in right now to our passive income report for 2023, the month of January. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. All right, Russ, this is the question of the day. Passive income in 2023. It can sometimes feel a little bit overwhelming, like what is actually working right now with inflation going crazy, with a lot of like, I think political and government type pressures around people and economically it's just not, it just doesn't feel right. Is that, I mean, is that a fair statement? I don't think it's felt right in a long time, bro. I mean, is that, like, are you trying, I don't know who you're talking to here, right? It's like, there's a lot of factors when everything seemed to be going right. I felt like everything was going wrong, right? When everybody yeah. else is, like buying and selling houses every you know six months and making 150% over above what they paid for it. That felt wrong to me. I now, totally as, now as interest rates for residential homes are between six and 8%, it feels wrong. It's probably more normal, more, more likely to be right than wrong, but still I'm, I'm watching the financial markets and I don't think, I don't see things crashing. That feels wrong. Right. Like I know that this thing is literally totally. being it, there's the little Dutch boy with his finger in the dam. And I've been waiting for him to be overcome for a long time. So I, I don't know what you wanted for me, but yeah, it didn't feel right at all. I was thinking Pinocchio. You were thinking the Dutch boy, you know, somebody's up there like maneuvering or manipulating the market. That's how it feels to me. So, Russ, tell me this, though, in light of that. 
what else can we do? Like, what are the things that you feel like are on the agenda for 2023 that people should be considering if they haven't already considered so far? Here's the thing I think is a real consideration, especially in the environment we're in, is, is buying real estate creatively, finding ways to go purchase homes from someone who has bought them in the last one to three years, five years, and now they're potentially underwater. Maybe they don't have the ability to pay a realtor and get as much as maybe they even have in, you know, in a loan against it, but need to move for whatever reason. I think there, there's a big opportunity for buying real estate creatively. I think there's a really interesting area that could be explored from the short-term rental space, maybe into the midterm rental space, Joey, because I know yep. that that's an area that we're focused on. But even just buying long-term rentals through that methodology. I think you could acquire a decent amount of property now because you're not competing with everybody trying to buy a property the way you were just nine months ago. And I think you're going to find deals maybe that are sitting on that maybe have expired listings through MLS and that you could find opportunities to get in neighborhoods, get in markets that you've been wanting to do just by using maybe just your skill set to talk a little bit about buying on terms as compared to buying uh, with cash. Yep. I agree. I'm, I'm going to add a different strategy to the mix. Um, when we were at our inner circle live, there was three or four different people at that event who either had already done Turo or started the Turo business either with a car that they already had at the house that wasn't being used or being used intermittently or they just decided maybe this is a strategy that I can use to get started. And uh, one of our Passive Income Mastermind members, Brian Bly, was so gracious to several of the different people there. He's like, hey, I've already done it. If you want some help getting it set up, hit me up. He's like, man, I find great joy in helping people to get started into um, the entrepreneurial space. And, and man, I've heard three or four different people that were at that event that have already started that business and are seeing results. To me, that seems to be like the training wheels of becoming an entrepreneur. Let's like say if you never started a business before, and I'm not saying it's easy or anything like that, but I'm saying there's a lot of benefit to using a proven model that has a proven platform to, to get up off the ground. And I know you just recently bought a truck that you're going to put on Turo. So talk a little bit about that from your perspective. Well, I, I do agree that I think the accessibility to get into that rental space is really easy, right? We, we got into the short-term rental space because we were just arbitraging someone else's apartment or their condo or their townhouse yep. or their house. Now you have the ability to buy a truck, a car, and for a monthly payment on it, you might be able to rent it out on a platform like Turo, or there's lots of other ones, and make a profit over and above what it costs you to have and learn how to run a business. That's what I'm trying to do with my girls is to, to teach them entrepreneurship. But the only way to really teach them is by just doing it. And it's so hard with a lot of other things that we're involved in to, to really teach them the the little bitty pieces within it because we'd already started. But this is something that's starting from the ground. And I, I think that what's interesting about this space, and there's lots of other ones, right? We've had Dave Zook come and speak to our passive income mastermind several different times. And he always likes to talk about when you want something, why not be able to buy it and let someone else pay for it, right? And you just use it. And whether that's an from an airplane all the way down to a Tesla, right? And what I, I really like is I wanted a truck because – we live out in the sticks. That's partially why my internet is so poor. <laughs> but that we have to drive a mile to take my trash up to the trash cans. And I don't want to put that on my car, in my car, on top of my car. right? And I wanted a truck to do it. Well, now our goal is to be able to rent the truck out enough times throughout the month to be able to pay for the truck. So I'll have use of the truck, but not have to pay for it. Like, that's really exciting to me. And if I can teach my girls along the way and, you know, you and I are already utilizing paying our kids to our marketing companies because they 
by them doing things just like this, we get to talk about it here on the podcast, it becomes an expense. Well, they can use that money to pay for the things they're already doing, their own uh, school activities and extracurricular activities. So now we can like get money to them legally while they're learning how to do a business and we can talk about it to help others. I think there's a lot of fun stuff there. Now, something I'll uh, kind of piggyback behind Turo is to say car washes, right? Once you have a car that you're on putting on Turo, it's got to be clean, right? So uh, car washes to me have opened my eyes to a very inefficient model in the terms of there's really no player that owns the market, right? There's not one brand that is 40% market share. In fact, there's... I think no brand has more than like 5% market share, maybe even lower than that. And to me, there's a big uh, appetite at the highest level investor, like these funds that um, are looking for investing. They're looking to buy big conglomerations of car washes and put them into their, their pension funds or whatever it may be. That to me is an opportunity. And especially if you have the right operators that you can work with. So to me for 2023, I think that that's a, a place that we want to get involved in. We're still trying to, you know, kind of tease that out a little bit, but I think that that's a way that um, I'd like to see us go. Here's a, here's a thing that we've been working on and haven't been able to pull the trigger yet, mostly just because of being distracted, right? Like I think the, Easiest thing to believe is that Joey and I have all the time in the world to be able to just focus on any passive income activity we want, and and we can come up with 10 new ones this month. Well, we could come up with 10 new ones. We just don't have the time to actually pursue them. And I think that you probably relate to that, right? Life, even at the basic level with kids and family activities and family obligations, in addition to the active businesses that we own, they take our time. And there's a lot of things that we would like to be able to do that we just don't get to. But one of the things that's on my agenda this year, Joey, is for us to be able to buy two or three existing e-commerce brands, brands that are most likely already selling on a platform like Amazon, but that have opportunities to be grown. Because I I get text messages, it seems like once or twice a month from clients of ours, friends of ours who have these brands and they're just – I think gloating, right? They're literally <laughs> boasting and rubbing my nose in the fact of how great their brands are. I mean, the guy was telling me the other day, he's up to over $550,000 a month right now in revenue from his e-commerce brand. He was like, it was 350 just in November. And I'm like, man, that's just sick. It makes me, that's the, the FOMO for me is in that world because I do think We could acquire a lot of those. I think there's a big opportunity. The second opportunity, I think, for us is because of just our network of people. We spend a lot of time in and around the land geek world and the land flipping world. I think we should and can start a fund to be able to lend to the land flippers out there. And I I think that that's an easy world. People who follow us and even you may be doing this personally, you may be utilizing the infinite banking concept. And Joey, I I think for us, we have a, a big opportunity and a network of people that seems to fit right in to where we could potentially lend money to the land flipping world to allow them to to buy the properties that maybe they're running out of capital for and make it a win-win for both of us. What do you think about that? Oh, for sure. I mean, this is, uh, you know, we talk about the investor DNA on our show quite a bit. That's the profile that tells you who you are as an investor, what the pros and cons are for each of these strategies that we've been talking about today. And for me, I'm, I'm an S and an S is very loyal, um, kind of steady, doesn't like a lot of change, doesn't like a ton of like variation in the marketplace. And private lending is one of our favorite things in the world because it's just super simple. It's totally hands off and it really doesn't require um, a lot of like, concerned with the market if you have the right collateral. Well, we're talking about lending and lending to land uh, pieces of land that are don't have any termites, don't have any tenants or anything to worry about. And so, and we're buying them typically at 30, 25 to 30% retail market. If you can buy property like that, do you, I mean, 
I have no hesitation lending against that sort of collateral. Well, I, so I have a guy right now, Joey, I have a guy right now that came to me and said, hey, I, I have a piece of property. So he's a young loan, land flipper. I was asking him how his land business was going. He works out at the same gym that I do. He, he heard our podcast. He listened to Mark Podolsky. He's gone to some of the boot camps. And he was just like, man, I think I'm going to. I was like, well, how, how's it going? You buying property, selling property? He's like, well, you know, I, yeah, I bought and sold a couple. He's like, I, I got a property right now. People want to sell me. I just don't have enough cash to buy it. So I think I'm just going to have to let it go. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> why would you do that? <laughs> He's like, well, I mean, I, I literally don't have the money to buy. And I said, okay, well, here's the deal. Give me your due diligence on the property so I can see the property. And assuming it meets our criteria, we will buy the property for you, right? So you you get the offer, get everything lined up. We will provide the capital. Our name will go on. Um, and then we will land Arbit back to you. Now, for those of you who don't understand what that means, means we will then basically finance the property back to him at a price. So let's just use fake numbers here. Let's assume that he was buying the property for $10,000. We pay you the $10,000. We own the property. Then we give it back to him at say $200 a month and he goes and tries to market it and find someone who will pay him more than $200 a month. So that way he gets to make money, but yet he didn't have to put anything up. All he had to do is mail it out, find the uh, potential buyer, negotiate the deal and bring it to us. And he's like, man, now that I know that, I really want to go find a lot of properties because now I don't have to have as much skin in the game. And I think if you're a land flipper out there and this is a situation that you have, reach out to us and we can have a conversation about that. You can email us at info at wealthwellwallstreet.com and we can set up a time and have a conversation. So, Joey, to me, like that is a very big opportunity. But I want to I want to bring up something because I want to get into our, our passive income report for last month. Sure. But people, they're, they're listening and they're trying to figure out how do you do deals and and so I want to walk through a deal that you and I did a while back. And the reason I want to bring this specific deal up is because I, this past month I was asked by someone, Hey, I have an opportunity. I have a need and I need to borrow money. I need a loan, a short-term loan. And I don't think most people understand like, when does it make sense to be a lender to someone? When does it make sense um, for my capital to go into this deal. So you and I did a deal a while ago that I was using as the baseline for this, right? Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about the car loan that we did? Sure. Yeah. So this is, this is a while back, probably what, five or six years ago, had a guy that had a car that was owned free and clear. It was worth about 20 grand. He ran into some hard times. Uh, just the time of the year was difficult for his cash flow. He said, man, I need 10 grand and I've got this car. I'll put up as collateral. So to me, I'm just immediately like, man, that's a good deal to be at 50% of somebody's value is always a safe place to be the bank. So just that's, you know, idea number one, what is your collateral worth and what are you lending against it? The value percentage of that is a big deal. And the, the lower it can be, the better it is for you as the bank. The second thing I realized was because cash flow was really tight, I didn't want to set him up for failure with some really large monthly payment to repay me back, but I also didn't want this loan to be out there forever, right? Another thing about being the bank is you want to limit your exposure in the way of time, right? You don't want it to be dragged out to the point where the value of that collateral could be decreasing or some other effect on it could happen. And so I wanted it to be limited to a year, but I also said, um, I wanna make sure his payment is reduced enough to where he can make these payments consistently. So what I did is I said, well, let's make the payments interest only, right? That way I don't have to get caught up in calculating how much of this payment is going towards principal, how much of it's going towards interest. It's just any payment he makes me over the next six months is interest only. And it was a $10,000 loan. I said, just give me $100 a month, right, for six months. And at, But I wanted to incentivize him to pay me off sooner. And so I said, well, after six months, it goes to $200 a month. And so that way he doesn't want to get to that point. He might pay me off within the first six months. 
But the big kicker was, is whenever he paid me off, he had to pay the $10,000 plus a $1,000 kind of finance charge. So he'll pay me back a total of 11,000 plus the interest over each month. Long story short, he ended up paying me over nine months. And so you do the math, he paid 600 for the first six months and 600 for the next three months. Uh, so nine months, he paid me $1,200 in interest plus 11,000 back total. That turned out to be, uh, I didn't do the math ahead of the schedule here, but somewhere around 26%. And um, it was a great loan for us for that year. So much so that he came back to us three or four months later and said, can we do that again? <laughs> if you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the Passive Income Operating System, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income. It makes all the steps come together. If you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener, we've never given this away in public before. Go to whatswhatwallstreet.com forward slash P-I-O-S. There was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying, pop quiz day. Why? Because you were unprepared. Are you unprepared, though, for financial freedom? Don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30 second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. Yeah, I, I bring that up because there's times where people will come to you, right? If you're out there looking for opportunities, people are going, deals will find you, right? And, and we're not unique that we have deal flow every single day and every single week. It's not because of anything other than we're putting it out to the world. We're, we're live on YouTube right now. You, you may have a deal and you may be reaching out to us because we're talking about looking for opportunities. I promise you, if you go out and you're sitting at the, the ball fields and you're having conversations and if somebody says, hey, what do you do for a living? If you don't repeat back what you actually do for a living, like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm an attorney or I'm an accountant or whatever you think, you're like, I'm a real estate investor. I, I do private lending for people. If you say things like that, I promise you, you're going to start finding deals, right? And hopefully that is what you do. Hopefully that is what you're aspiring to do. And, and so by talking about that, you will find opportunities. People will come to you. But also the part to this is deals have to be win-wins. Like that guy did not have to do the, the, the car loan with us. He could have went to the bank. He could have went to um, the the payday loan lender, right? Yep, title, title to a, loans. A, yep. a, a title loan. He had other options. But what did he choose us for? He chose us for speed and for flexibility and creativity, right? I think that what you have to understand, like when we do deals, I have, and the reason I brought this up is I had a guy reach out to me recently and he said, hey, Russ, I need to make a loan. And I was like, I'm probably not your guy. And I... I really would push someone to go do a traditional loan before they come to me because I'm not going to be the best deal unless you're looking for flexibility, right? The ability to be able to have that loan transact within seven days, which we could make happen for us to be able to give him interest only hundred dollar a month payments, which is really flexible in that person's environment. That was why he transacted with us. That's what the deal was for. And so when somebody told, asked me recently for a loan, I said, hey, I'm probably not your person. I said, well, why are you not my person? I said, because here's my terms. I'm going to, I will be willing to do interest only. It's going to be a, a, a balloon at the end of six months. And if you need to go longer than that, here's what that term is going to look like. But you're probably not going to want to do it with me. And by the way, this guy actually chose not to do the deal with me, which I'm grateful for, right? But I see the, the loan that you and I did, and I thought, man, what a win-win it was for that individual because they knew they were going to have the cash in the future, but they didn't have the cash flow now and go into the bank and needing money. So when people need liquidity, when you need liquidity, it comes at you at 1,000 miles an hour, right? You don't have the ability to go down to the bank. And, and uh, one, 
know that no loan is free, right? You go down there, they're going to knock you over the head with at least $750 to $1,500 worth of origination payments, right, for a $10,000 loan, even if they're willing to do it because they don't even like loans that small, right? Banks don't want to do small loans. Banks want to do big loans. It requires too much effort for them to go through the hassle of doing that. So I think that there's a market for many of you who are in the infinite banking space to learn how to do some of these smaller deals, but make sure that, like Joey said, that you have collateral that is at least two times what you're lending out. And Joey, one of the things you didn't go through, which was we we took over title, right? We, we, we had title in hand, just like uh, if you were at the payday lender or the title loan lender, they're going to have title in hand. We, we had stipulations of if you're late, here's what the payment's going to be. We had them change us to be a lien holder on their insurance policy. So if they go out and crash that thing, we're going to get paid first by the insurance company before they get paid, right? Yep. There's lots of little nuggets in there that can be done. And by the way, all the legal documents that we created, which we were able to do pretty quickly and swiftly, who paid for that, Joey? We did. No, we did not. We didn't pay for any of that. We, we charged it straight to them. What are you talking oh, about? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I don't remember. You know, this is like years ago. I don't remember yesterday. But but that's the point. I think most people would forget what, what should, who should pay for that, right? Like, has the bank ever paid for any of that stuff? No. Heck no, they haven't. Now, if you do a $5 million loan with them, they may figure out a way to, you know, waive some of those payments. Now, Garrett asked me in the, in the notes here, Joey, what's the biblical backing if we were to be loaning money to a fellow Christian for interest? How would you respond to, to Garrett about that? Man, to be honest, I'd, I'd love to hear more talk on this because I, I don't pretend to be, uh, you know, the end all be all of this. The way I looked at it is exactly kind of how you you just put it out there. This this gentleman, I, I'm not certain if he's a believer or not. I, I think he was. Um, but man, if he had the opportunity to go somewhere else, that's fantastic. He should. Um, and we, we gave him many opportunities. Hey, are you sure you want to do this? Cause this is, this is the terms, like you said, we outlined that for him. And the second way I look at it is, is I think of it more from the standpoint of being the steward that we are. And I think partly because the resources that you and I have are not ours, right? It's been given to us to steward well. And so I think of it as, um, you know, the parable of the talents. I've been given a talent that I need to go out and grow. And there are ways in which I can do that. I can do it in certain businesses. I can do it in lending relationships and so on and so forth. In this case, I chose to lend it um, in order to grow that capital that it was given to me. And the other part of it is I feel like that he was able to really benefit from that transaction. Although the interest calculation was high to your point it actually helped him through a very difficult time so much so that he came back and asked for it over again so that that to me is but i'd love to somebody to challenge me on this and say joey ah eh, that's not what god's word says about this i'd love to learn i'm always learning well he, here's the thing i think there's an opportunity right for us to find generosity and mercy and to create a nonprofit that could lend to other believers. And, and there, there are those spaces out there, by the way, that we're not, I don't, I believe that's what we're necessarily called to do personally. That's not the gift that I was given, but I do think there's an opportunity for us to, to be a good steward and to, to share. But I mean, we've talked about this a lot, Joe, we've done family banking, right? We've done family deals with our own families, both up and down the ladder. And, some people think, oh, when you do deals with family, you give deals. And I think that that's the opposite, right? And the, the guy that came to me for the loan and the, the one that recently that didn't do it, I think he, because he knew me pretty well, I think he thought I was going to give him a deal. He was looking for me to give him $10,000 and he was going to pay me back over the next two to three weeks, he said. I mean, again, I'm sure he had good intentions and he wanted to give me $200 for that. Now, if you did $200 over a seven to 10 day window and I mean, extrapolated that out, it's a pretty good return, but yet $200 in the big scheme of things for me to go have to create a document um, to, you know, that would uh, be able to, um, uh, I'm losing my, my thought here. If you had a, if you had a document out there to, 
to make sure you got the money back, right? If he didn't actually fulfill the promise, what, what does that cost, right? What's the, like for me to go borrow $10,000, is it, and, and be able to access the money and hand it to him, is that really worth $200? Like for me, the math just didn't make sense. Well, what, so, what like, you're pointing well, out was, though, let me jump in. What you're pointing out though, is something that I didn't think about before we started infinite banking, right? Infinite banking, what does it do? It, it shows you that your capital has a cost, right? Before understanding infinite banking, you think I have $10,000. Yeah, I can lend it to somebody without interest. It actually is costing you interest to have access to that capital. Well, it's, no costing matter you, what. it's costing you interest. It's costing you brain space in order to think about the deal. What happens if it doesn't come back in seven days? What is that going to cost me? Just every second I think about is the deal coming back. And so I was really trying my best to, to figure out that, that math. But also the problem is, that we don't think about is the biblical standard is the one who loves is the one who disciplines, right? So how can I create a standard that I can actually follow through on? Like to me, creating an actual loan with all of the parameters of how you have to pay it back and making it where if they pay it back, great. If they don't pay it back, great. Like to me, that's the standard that I want to do any loan on is that, I want it to be a good deal either way, right? I'm not sitting there hoping for their demise. I'm actually hoping for the opposite, but I want them to succeed. Well, it needs to be good enough for them to succeed to pay me back, right? Because here's the thing. What if I, if, I, if I did a loan at 3%, Joey, instead of the 26% that we did? I'm actually rooting for this joker to not pay me back to some degree so I can get the $20,000 car and make more money. I mean, I think that would be the opposite end of it. Right. Right. I, I think, and also in order for me to charge 3%, we probably would have had to charge him like a thousand dollars a month to get the money back just so that way they would be encouraged to pay the money back. Exactly. Right. Because otherwise, if we gave them such a, such a deal, they wouldn't want to pay it back, which then could lead to them going and spending the money that they had and not repaying it and going deeper into debt. And I don't think that would be something that would be good for our brother either, right? So That's right. Anyway, that's right. All right, let, let's let's touch on really quickly the our passive income report from January 2023. I think this is an opportunity for us to hit on a couple of things. I hope you guys enjoyed this discussion because ultimately we are we are here just like you guys. We're we're learning through this process. And imperfectly, maybe we're a step or two in front of you, maybe a step or two behind you. And every time we get a chance to, to learn, we, we want to share it on this podcast. So for you, that you don't necessarily have to go through the same pain points that we had. A lot of things that we're going to be focused on this year. But here's some of the stuff that we did um, this 2023. All right, Stallion. So in January, um, our land business continues to be a high point for us. We did have several of those notes default. So we were on a track. We were getting closer to close to 26,000 in gross uh, revenue uh, for that business. It's now 24,721. So it tells you there's some variation here with the number of notes that you have currently and what can happen in a um, you know higher default rate type of time frame. which by the way, just let you know, going into 2023, 2024, I expect there to be a significant number of defaults, more than we've seen in the past two and a half years, because if people have bought land on terms and they run into really hard times with their other, like their jobs or, or economic conditions continue to, to get worse for them, I do expect this to be one of the first places that they would let go. And, if it, and if from that, are you... So here, here's a key, right? Like going through what we were just talking about with lending, right? In a in a situation of what would be merciful, and and what is the 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 profitable way to handle this transaction, right? Like where if someone buys a piece of property from us and they're paying us monthly until they can pay off the note, right? That's when we will actually exchange uh, hands and, and hand them over the deed, so then they could do what, uh, whatever they want to with the property. But if they get to a point to where it's more profitable them or more uh, beneficial for them to stop paying us. 
and to, to do whatever the next thing is. Maybe it's pursue another uh, venture that they have. Maybe it's because, man, that, that month's payment is between them and a ham sandwich, right? Like uh, we, we never want to be the decision where someone is not uh, able to, to, to feed themselves. Well, first, what are we going to do? First, we're going to make every arrangement possible to keep them. And people say, well, is that true? Is that really what you want to do? Well, here's the thing. And for us, it costs money to find a new purchaser. So yep. absolutely, we want to work a deal out with them. We want to make every arrangement we possibly can for them to keep the property. But in almost every scenario where we have a property where the person stops paying, they tell us, nope, I, I'm not ever going to be able to pay them. It, it's just best for me to stop now. And if I, if I ever need another property, I'm going to come back to you guys because just the way that you guys handled me in this property, I know that you'll handle me correctly the next. And with that sort of um, background, we are okay doing deals where sometimes people are not going to be able to continue. And we make arrangements, try to figure out a way to, to you know, if we need to give them a grace period, give them, give them a chance to get back on the, uh, on the bandwagon, we do. But most of the times they come to us and they say, it's just not a good fit. I need to stop. Yep. Um, the other thing I'll add, we didn't have any cash sales this month in terms of the land business, uh, which those are kind of nice to have from time to time, but we don't bank on it. Our, our main bread and butter is always the term sale. So the second thing we have is our wake up in Birmingham dot com um, short term rental business. So what do you want to hit on just some quick highlights from that low light in this case that uh, this is the second month in a row that we've lost money in this business. And yep. it, we know that like now having been in this business almost three years, we get the fact that there are cyclical times based on the way we built our business model. And we've mentioned this before. If we had it to do over again, we would buy bigger properties that would house people for more things like more midterm, long-term rentals um, that would still give us the, the benefit of the short-term rental feet. So for instance, yep. someone that's looking to um, have their house re remodeled, they have to move out for 90 days or something. We can get a lot more revenue on that person, but they're just not going to go into our two bedroom apartments that we have. And so that's kind of a, a point where we missed when we built this business. Yeah. What else would you add yeah. to that? Yeah. I, I think this is, we're just uh, taking our medicine at this point. I think we're, we're experiencing, being in a slow time frame for our market, right? Like if we were in a vacation destination market, I don't think we would be going through this exact same time frame. But we're in a kind of an urban metro market that de is dependent upon business travel and uh, kids uh, travel sports. And December and January are just slow, slow months from that, and. There has not been a lot of um, need for replacement homes, right? Like, you know, last year we actually did okay in December and January because there had been a humongous storm that caused a lot of people to come into some of our units. And, you know, thankfully for, for our, our market, we didn't have people that had that, that need and there was enough um, places for them to go. To your point, if we would have had bigger units, uh, if we had more single family homes, we could have weathered this lower season. So we're just having to just eat it right now. And I, we do see it uh, picking back up. You are seeing those natural travel sports that are starting to happen. A little more uh, travel happens uh, after December and January for businesses. We, we'll see some uh, months in the black as we move forward. But yeah, it's just Oh, just by, by the way, the medicine at this point, one other thing I'll add just some uh, behind the scenes on this is at least two of our units were down for weeks because of a water leak that we had some really cold weather that came in in January that caused some pipes to burst. And um, one of them in a condo complex and uh, one of them in an apartment complex and both had to be out of commission to be renovated for several weeks, that that's a big killer for revenue as well, as you can imagine. Hey, Joey, do you know if we're getting uh, revenue from insurance companies for that sort of stuff? I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. I think there's an application out for that, but I don't know that it's actually occurred. Okay. And so just if you're, if you're not watching this live with us on YouTube um, or Facebook, 
we're we lost in the month of January just under eight thousand um, dollars in, in the month of or excuse me about eighty three hundred dollars in the month of um, January. And and for those of the you know there's a lot of people out there that are operating their own short term rental business and they're not experienced in the negatives. Well, because they are actually doing and performing the function. For us, we're paying someone. So technically, what we've paid is greater than what we have lost, right? So that's what's that's factoring right. into our loss. Had we not had that, then we would have uh, had a positive, but it would have come into the fact that we would have been trading our time for that activity. That's now, right. the, you get into just a few other line items. I know we're, we're, we're needing to wrap up here, but uh, we years ago, we did a, a syndication inside the ATM space where we bought seven ATMs. It's a part of a bigger group. And those ATMs are, provide cash flow every single month for us for the next seven years. And, you know, Joey, I like looking every single month and seeing that money deposited in there. We've made some investments at the end of last year in a couple of different things that are not listed here yet, just because they're through that startup phase that we're going to start seeing cash flow just like that, that we'll be able to list on here. We've got um, money in long-term rentals, which is one of the units that you were talking about um, that we were uh, paying. And to be honest, uh, that's your unit. I'm trying to figure out why we're paying you given that we couldn't use the unit. Maybe you should have given us um, that month for free. I'm going to have to have a discussion with you later on that. Hey, I'm just saying, uh, you know, the, you guys entered into a lease. You're going to pay me regardless. I'm just saying. I don't know. I don't know what the story is. Well, we just file a claim against your insurance to get for, <laughs> for you to pay us for the lost revenue. Maybe you know we'll, we'll figure out a middle ground there. Yeah. I, you you've got uh, you, you dabbled into the Turo space just in a different spot. It was the RV space. Cousin Eddie looks like uh, it's having another stellar month again. Hey, uh, January is a rough month. I'm just going to go ahead and say it and. It was, uh, yeah, it, we, we made a total of $604 in the month of January and uh, paid out $728. To, to your point, it lost $124, but it was it, under a new management. And uh, so I'm grateful to have the first, you know, the first um, trip under our belt. And so we'll see how it goes are, with this. New are, are you program. are you seeing, because I, I busted you up on this before saying, I feel like you had bad management here. And it turns out I was right. They decided to go out of business. They were so poor at what they were doing. You um, now have a new group. Are you are you seeing the calendar on this? Is this something where Cousin Eddie's going to stay rented out, or what, what's your what are you seeing right now? You know, I actually just reached out to the managers on this um, about a week or so ago, and they are they are saying that this is still a really really slow time of year. They manage an entire fleet, as you can imagine. And uh, they said that in the month of January, they only had two that were out on trips. So this is just a rough time of year. Um, I think that March will be when they actually start to come back around because people start traveling for spring break and things of that nature. And hey, surely uh, there's somebody wanting to have a Valentine's, you know, ride in, in the, in, in Eddie, right? Cousin like, Eddie, I mean, come on. You don't have to think full of, I, he's I think a romantic this is a marketing, ride. I'm gonna, this is a just romantic. a marketing issue, bro. Like cousin Eddie should come with like, you know, two dozen roses and a, you know, bottle of, you know, strawberry, um, Boots Farm or something like that. I mean, there's going to be something that you can do to increase the marketing. <laughs> Right. Come on. You hey, guys know you, hey, you grew up you in the heard 90s. It, you you know heard it here. If you if you want cousin Eddie for Valentine's, <laughs> let me know. And I will I will foot the Boons farm. Okay. It, it's on me. Oh man. All right. So we, we have an information business that we created and a lot of a lot of um, things we were able to to create inside of that company. It continues to be a place that you know, this is really what gave us the inspiration for creating this passive income report is that we were at a, a convention podcast movement several, several years ago. And we got a chance to meet a couple of guys, John Lee Dumas and uh, Pat Flynn, and both of them had really explored and uh, and through their journey of creating their own courses and learning, we're just giving back to the world. And 
a part of that, they were creating value, which uh, money always follows value. And that was an inspiration for us. So just building courses, building groups for people to interact with uh, has been uh, a, a really fun thing for us. We utilize the money that we make out of that and, and always are uh, reinvesting into buying new things, uh, passive income uh, related items. And, and you know, we, we try our best to, to utilize that also to make investments in the things that we could talk about here. So, you know, part of the money that I'm using to, to buy the truck came from, you know, the revenue from that. And it's just to me, it's just an opportunity for us to teach. And, and to explore. So there's going to be new things that we'll teach you on this, uh, this year that comes out of that. We did, uh, we have a private note fund out there and got paid in that. And, um, you know, as always for you guys, uh, all 56 of you watching this on YouTube right now, I appreciate you. And, uh, we, we made $106 on YouTube last month because of that. And yes, it, you know, click a couple more of those ads, you know, who knows next month is $115. <laughs> nowhere to go but up right uh, just a fun thing to see and uh, as always hopefully that you were able to take a couple of ideas from this we we have a lot of opportunities coming up in 2023 we're going to be adding to this list uh, i was telling joey you know a month ago like we we've got to to get after this because we owe it to you to explore new opportunities to share with you new ways that you can create passive income and we say this, and this is truthful. We don't want you to follow everything that we say. <laughs> that is a bad idea. Like, please do not try to go in 12 different directions. It's not advisable. And to be honest, I think it's what, you know, has us, you know, distracted in some of these areas and maybe some of them are not as focused. And as a result, we don't see the, the revenue from it, but we do um, use those as examples for you to be able to learn because one of those things is going to meet your investor DNA. And if that's the thing that gets you to passive income faster, then that became a win for us. No doubt. And as always, we appreciate you. We hope that if you found value, you'll share this, you'll rate the podcast, you'll review us. Um, and yeah, continue to get the word out about wealth without wall street, create the freedom that uh, that you're seeking and then share it with somebody else. As always, we'll see you on the next episode. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.